Howdy YouTube and welcome to this episode of The Gunman. So today we're doing some prep work on this Mazda 3. So the name of the colour is Soul Red Crystal and that is the paint code of 46V. Now, on the topic of the colour, just did you see the colour of those door jams? It is atrocious what Mazda, the paintwork that Mazda, like the quality of the paintwork that Mazda do on their vehicles is just terrible. I'm sorry Mazda, like don't mean you any ill will but I as a spray painter could never never buy a Mazda um, well the only way that I would buy one is if I got it and then resprayed it because the quality of the paintwork is just shocking like they must put one ultra thin coat of clear coat over um, the panels and on the inside they don't even get enough color like it's not even covered the outside of the um, the panels look amazing like don't get me wrong the color is just to die for I think that this color is actually a um, it's a candy color and I think it's actually a real candy um, so the first uh, soul red was just called soul red and that was a uh, paint coat of 41 V uh, and this one here is called 46V, but it's Soul Red Crystal, and I believe this one here is an actual candy. Um, so anyway, we'll have a bit more of a chat about that later on. Um, yeah, so what we're doing in this video is just the prep work. So we'll go right through the prep work, and yeah, we've got like a couple of little repairs, like last minute repairs, which I found on the vehicle. We'll go through that, a little bit of spot priming with some UV primer. And um, in the second video, so yeah, this will be a three-part series, this um, yeah, video set. Um, and we're going to do masking in the second one, and then paint application in the third one. We won't be following it up with the fourth video this time, because I didn't actually get the video footage of the polishing stage. Um, and I'm sure there's some detailers out there who won't approve of my polishing methods. Uh, no, I'm just kind of joking. We'll leave that for another episode or... Yeah, get, get a bit more involved in I do actually have a polishing video coming up soon. I've got it all edited up, and I do actually just need to do the um, the narration on that. So, yeah, I've actually got quite a few videos in the editor at the moment. I'm sure some of you will be um, glad to hear. So, yeah, lots more videos coming up soon, hopefully. Um, yeah, I did actually take a little bit of a, a break recently. So, all of that aside, now what I'm doing here is I actually found that that line towards the back end, obviously where I'm putting the filler now, like to where the bumper met up with the um, quarter panel there, I could just tell by blocking it that it wasn't right. Now, I'm not having a dig at the panel beaters for not getting it right. It's just how the cookie crumbles sometimes, you know? Sometimes they miss things. And at the end of the day, I think the guy that did it's not long out of his time. And look, I'm not here to bag on my workmates, you know, I really don't even care, like, I, I always point it out to them, just so that they can sort of take it on board and maybe try and, you know, improve on the next time, but it's always positive, you know, it's, it's not like, oh, I hate you, I mean, it can get frustrating in a workshop when you're expected to perform and get X amount of cars painted, but at the end of the day, it really doesn't bother me, um, having to do a little repair here and there like this, and I guess that's helped by the fact that we don't work on one of those bonus schemes, like, and that's why, that's a big part of the reason I hate those bonus schemes, and look, I mean, I refuse to work in a shop that uses them, um, by choice, obviously, like, if, if I absolutely needed a job, and that's all I could get was a, uh, a place that had a bonus scheme, look, I would reluctantly do it until I found something better, but... Yeah, I do kind of feel for all the people out there that are working on those bonus schemes because what it ends up doing is um, actually lowering the quality of work in the workshop because let's just say um, the panel beaters don't care because they just want to get the thing through, smashed out quickly so that they can make their bonus. And then when the panty gets onto it, they're like, well, geez, the panel beater didn't do their job properly. Why should I do mine properly? Well, he didn't fix it, so I'm just going to paint over it. And just the way the whole system is um, set up, it's just, it's wrong, like, I believe it's wrong anyway, like, if you look at this job here, now, his repair was all below that swage line, and that section that you just saw me blocking above that swage line, that was a freebie dent that I did myself, there was like a small little sharp dent um, ab above that swage line, um, I don't want to go and paint over that, you know, I'll fix that any day of the week. Um, I would rather fix it and have a little bit of colour a touch higher than I would prefer. 
um, than go and paint over a sharp dent like within you know a, a foot less than a foot of our repair I just I don't know taking pride in my work I, I don't like doing that kind of thing but all of that aside I obviously blocked the entire thing down so yeah what did I do from the very start I, I got sidetracked talking about other things at the start of this video so the very first thing I did was um, obviously prime it I actually went over and saw this job in the panel shop the night before and I said to the boss, hey, let's get that over, let's get it primed. And they said, oh, we're waiting on the bumper cover, the rear bumper. Um, so I said, look, we can prime it up. And if they need to refix it later tomorrow, well, then at least we've got primer on most of it. So got it over, primed it up the night before. Um, he actually checked it. He thought he, he was all good with his bumper. But then I sort of um, begged to dis disagree, even though I'm the painter. But um, yeah, so as, as, as I said before, I did that small um, filler repair down the back edge of the line. Um, and then cleaned all the panels down. I left all the plastic on the vehicle, as you probably noticed. That's just mainly to keep the, the vehicle clean when I'm doing my prep work. It also really helps in situations like this. As you can see, I'm re-priming a section. Now I don't have to go and put a piece of plastic over the entire car to stop overspray. So, yeah, I've found that works well. It's something that uh, maybe eight months ago I never really used to do, and I just started doing it, and I'm like, why, why haven't I been doing this for my entire career? Because <laughs> I used to always just, like, unmask the car. Um, first up, I'd just unmask the car and then just start prepping it up, and then... Yeah, sometimes you would have to re-prime a section and you, I don't know, run the risk of getting overspray or have to cover the entire car and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I have found that that works good. It keeps the car clean and also, yeah, keeps stuff off of the car and, yeah, it's all good. So, next up, obviously, I'm putting the, oh, sorry, next up, I did block the vehicle down, obviously, and then I found that repair and then did the repair and now I'm putting some UV primer on. So... This is a amazing product. It's something that's actually been around for quite some time. I remember talk of this UV primer when I was still an apprentice. So it must have been like 2002. It was kind of new around then. Everyone was talking about it. All this UV primer, UV primer this, UV primer that. Um, and then it kind of went away. Like I, I don't think I even used it. And it, I think it was a PPG product. That's right. Like yeah, The PPG guys are talking about this UV primer. And it kind of went away and then it made a real resurgence i guess mainly a big part of it is to do with the um the light technology so now we've got led lights that are quite cheap to buy and um reliable a lot more reliable than globes so i believe that some of the um earlier um uv curing lights were actually quite dangerous and harmful the radiation that they were giving off so ultraviolet light um, is actually um, it's invisible so you can see a certain part of the spectrum but the the part that's actually going to be hurting you is you can't even see it um, so and yeah those rays actually kind of yeah penetrate through the body and cause cancer basically I've done a little bit of research on it but um, I've found, I've been told I, I guess I'm just like crossing my fingers and hoping they're right with this one but I have been told that the 395 uh, nanometer wavelength UV LEDs are relatively safe. So, I mean, take that with a grain of salt if you're really, really concerned about UV radiation um, and cancer and stuff like that. I, I would approach it with caution, you know. Um, and yeah, even, even if you're not concerned too much about it, I would still approach it with caution. Um, but yeah, just, it's just like everything, just take care. I mean, you can't, you, you wouldn't go and spray two pack fumes without a respirator. So why would you spray UV prime without a respirator? You know, personally, I now wouldn't even block a two pack primer down without a proper particle filter and charcoal filtered respirator. So I wouldn't even block it down. So I definitely wouldn't spray it. Um, that's even two pack, and I definitely wouldn't do it. You, can, you actually probably saw just then my respirator is always around my neck when I'm at work in the workshop, and when I'm inside the spray booth, I've got my air fed respirator on. So yeah, do do take health and safety stuff pretty seriously. I reckon it's one of those things that we've came a fair way in the last sort of 25 years. I'd say like back in the 90s and previous to the 90s um it used to be like ah oh, look at this pussy wearing his safety gear you know you don't need any of that and 
Yeah, I've worked with some, some of the older guys and literally seen them in there spraying without even a respirator, man. Like, the only time some of these older guys will wear a respirator is when they're spraying the two-pack clear. Like, I've seen this guy in there um, spraying two-pack isocyanate-filled um, wet-on-wet primer, which is no better at all than the clear coats. And his mind, it's fine, you know? I'm, I'm just like man what are you doing to yourself you know 60 years old i mean yeah well i guess each to their own and some people well i guess it's one of those things that like once they're at that age they can't really be told you know what i mean like sort of a bit bit past being able to like hey man are you respirator because they know better you know what i mean so yeah i guess it's one of those things that I, i've even changed a lot in the last five years since um even since starting this channel if you go back and you watch the very first uh video on this channel i'm in the spray booth spraying i think it's like a, a honda accord or something like that i'm in the booth without a airfed respirator um with a singlet and t-shirt like singlet and shorts and runners or something like that like I look back and no gloves, you know, like no skin protection or very minimal. I look back on that and I'm like, man, what the hell was I doing? What was I thinking, you know? But that's one of those things, you know, life's a, a journey and as long as you continue to try to improve yourself, as long as you're not going backwards, it's all good, I guess. And, you know, if, if my experiences can help a couple of you guys, well then, yeah, it's, it's, it's worth it, I guess. Um, so obviously once I got that primer down, I did give it a light block and that was just with 320. Um, UV primer is one of those things that you can like put a coat or two on and then give it a block and then put another coat or two on um, after obviously using the UV light. So UV primer is not something that you can go and put like four coats on straight up. You want to put a couple of coats down, sand it back, dry it um, and then put another coat down. Uh, and then dry that and then block it and then usually that's okay so yeah UV primer is really for small sections it's not you know you wouldn't prime say that whole quarter panel um, with the UV primer um, I, I have seen some people do it but I don't know the price of the UV primer and the way that it sands it's it's really not as nice to sand as two packs so um, yeah it's just that's that's the way I use it and it's very handy handy uh, product in the workshop I reckon UV primer it definitely does save a bit of time and it improves the quality of some of the jobs you know like what was my other option putting a bit of two pack on it a couple of coats of two pack putting the infrared lights on it and then you're sort of looking at 35 40 minutes by the time it's dried whereas that UV primer it's, you're talking minutes literally minutes you know so very little downtime um, and it does dry rock hard so um, you've actually got like a good foundation to put your base coat colors down on and it actually won't shrink back so um, yeah it's it's really good stuff uh, but obviously before I did um, prep these blends up I gave them a good clean down so with some uh, methylated spirits and water a mixture you know um, I mean there's a few other different products that you can use that are basically exactly the same White spirits, basically the same. Denatured alcohol, if you're in the US, there might be, you know, a couple of little um, things, very minor differences in the chemical composition, but it does the same thing. So, yeah, denatured alcohol, mineral, uh, uh, sorry, meth methylated spirits or um, white spirits. I find it just um, dries up the water a little bit easier and it's a good cleaning agent, I find, as well. So, yeah, just prior to your prep work, give them a wipe down and dry them off and then obviously you know you probably noticed that I did um, cover the interior um, gaps up so where you open the door the holes for the door um, I don't I don't know like saw this guy a couple of weeks ago like panel guys he's doing bog work right next to um, someone's B pillar on the, on the vehicle and he's just got like the door wide open with no plastic over the door and I'm just like face palming I'm like man it's like a nice new Volkswagen Golf what are you doing <laughs> I told him off for it and he obviously put something there but like, man if that was my car and you just like I don't know you're treating it with no respect if you ask me like you're just covering the entire interior with um, with dust and Obviously someone's got to clean that, so someone out the back's got to clean it. You may as well just take yeah, one or two minutes and put a, put a bit of plastic over there, keep it clean, and um, yeah, treat the, 
treat the owner's car with a bit of respect, I guess. And yeah, it's all good, I guess. You know, it's, sometimes you just got to teach people these things. It's, um, I guess there was probably no malice intended when he did that thing. He just wasn't thinking about, say, um, a common thing around workshops. People just think of what's right in front of them rather than bigger picture, you know. Um, but one thing is probably worth keeping in mind is that um, with these Mazdas specifically, as I was saying at the very start, they really don't put much paint on them. So when I was sanding those blends down, I was just using 800 grit on the orbital sander. A lot of the time on the European vehicles, like pretty much all the European vehicles, there might be a couple of exceptions, but like all your Audis, BMWs, Volkswagens, Mercedes, all those kinds of things, um, they've got like a lot of material on them, like lots and lots of paint on there, and they've got a very thick orange peel, so it's, um, yeah, it, it's actually a better paint job, if that makes sense, but it's got more orange peel in it, so yeah. These cars here, these Mazdas, they've got a pretty flat finish to them, you know, not a very thick, heavy orange peel in them, a very fine, tight orange peel to them, but they've got no build on them. So what happens with these Mazdas, you let, especially here in Western Australia and Australia in general, like these Mazdas just don't last. They, you look at them a few years old, three or four years old, and there's just no clear left on them. Um, Mitsubishi's are another bad one for it. They don't seem to have such a bad name in the industry, but if you're, if you're a painter, you'll know what I mean. Like, the Mitsubishi's really don't put much paint on their cars. Um, and the quality of paint that they might, the clear coat, must just be dirt cheap. Um, to slam, slam them out, you know, um, start make a sale on them, and who cares about how long the, the paint job lasts. Whereas it seems like the, the European manufacturers seem to put a little bit more of an emphasis on quality than the Japanese do. Um, but yeah, so obviously sand all the um, edges down with a piece of 800 soft back sanding sponge. I think they're pretty handy to knock a bit of the orange peel out, but um, yeah, you do have to be careful with them because uh, you can cut through with them. And also if you don't put enough um, clear coat on, if you just put one coat of clear coat over that 800 grit, um, you might actually find some uh, cutback marks. Um, or yes, yeah, so it'll shrink back into the marks. Um, and then next up, just a bit of uh, gray scotch bright over all the edges, just to make sure I got rid of all the shiny spots. Uh, my apprentice, Alan, came back from trade school just like putting his head in his hand, saying, man, I thought I was bad for shiny spots. You should see some of the apprentices at trade school. And if you are an apprentice, just, I don't know, my best advice is to focus more on doing a good quality job than doing it fast or whatever and I know I was like this when I was young your mind's wandering you know you're thinking about what's going on on the weekend or what your mates and what you you know your girlfriend's up to on the weekend and that um, I guess that's part of just being an apprentice and growing up I guess but um, try to stay focused on the job and when you are doing a job just think about it systematically like um, like I did a respray the other day and you, uh, you've got to like do one stage, finish that stage, inspect it, and then move on to the next stage. So I just do a bit of this, a bit of blocking, a bit of sanding, a bit of hand sanding, a bit of bit of this, and a bit of scotching, and you get lost on the job. So just plan the job out and try to think it through. Um, anyway, that was pretty amazing. I don't think I've actually sat down and done a video start to finish, narrated, without st uh, stopping it or pausing it for a long time. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Until next time, get out there and play some shit. Stay tuned for number two um, next week. Thanks for watching. Yum, yum.